Good morning, everyone. Welcome to worship this morning at Ideal Park Church for this second Sunday in Advent as we consider the titles of Jesus, who he is, and, and who we are to acknowledge him to be. Um, I wanted to read this passage for us. So before that, um, just a few brief announcements. Um, back there, there's a little bowl next, uh, not, this, not tomorrow, but the next Monday, we're going to have a congregational meeting. Uh, here at church in the evening, uh, some details are in there, but if you need an absentee ballot to vote on stuff, like the budget, that's going to be back on that table, so make sure you grab that. Uh, also, if you note in your bulletin, there's going to be something, uh, we're, we're putting out a church calendar, we're hoping to put out a church calendar with lots and lots of great pictures of all of your beautiful faces. That's a good thing. Oh, yes. Well, and to that point, if somebody does not want their picture in there, Please let Tom know, because he's finalizing that, and um, if, uh, speak now or forever hold your peace, I suppose, because uh, then your picture is going to be out there every month for everybody to see, and I'm sure it would be a real blessing for people to see us and see each other in our homes and uh, see that reminder for us all. So again, we're coming this morning, uh, and we are considering the titles of Jesus, considering who he is this Advent season, and uh, well, I wanted to start with a passage that talks about Jesus' title, that is the Messiah. I want you to listen for this, and listen for this, uh, listen for this passage, listen for this title of Messiah as we read this. It says, In those days, Caesar Augustus issued a decree that a census should be taken of the entire Roman world. This was the first census that took place while Quirinius was governor of Syria. And Joseph went up to the town of Nazareth in Galilee, to Bethlehem in the town of Judea, and there he was to be registered to be, uh, to, with Mary, and she was pledged to be, she was married, and, and she was pledged to him, and expecting a child that is Jesus. And, and at that time, there were shepherds living out in the fields. They were out there nearby, keeping watch over their flocks. An angel of the Lord appeared to them, and the glory of the Lord shone around them, and they were terrified. But the angel said to them, do not be afraid. I bring you good news that will cause great joy for all the people. Today in the town of David, a Savior has been born to you. He is the Messiah, the Lord. That's supposed to be good news for them, and it is good news for us. And hopefully later we'll examine why exactly him being the Messiah is good news. But as he's come to us, he, he comes to us uh, clothed in flesh, and he invites us into this place of worship. I'm going to invite you to rise to receive our Messiah's greeting. Grace, mercy, and peace be to you from God our Father and from our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Let's turn and greet one another in the name of Christ.
This is the second Sunday of Advent. In a world where so many are sorrowful, God lights a candle of joy in our hearts. We wait together for a Savior who will be Emmanuel, Christ the Lord. Hear the word of the Lord. If you're visiting with us, we have a practice where we uh, take a few moments just to quiet ourselves and reflect on why we are here. And of course, we're here because we have a a God who has saved us and rescued us, and and we have a God who speaks the word into our lives, and we have a God who is uh, our Messiah, Jesus our Lord. Let's take a few moments before we come to God in a time of congregational prayer and just reflect on the marvelous truth that is... uh, that, that we have here before us. Let's go. Let's pray. We stop and marvel, Lord, at the amazingness that you would come down and lie in a manger, a lowly place where animals feed, a lowly place meant for uh, nourishing of the lowliest of even creatures, and yet you come to nourish us and to feed us. We come to recognize that not only did you come in a manger, but that you died on a cross. That while we were still guilty, while we were still doing wrong, while we were still wallowing in our own filth, you, Lord, said, it's okay. I want to rescue you. I want to give you a home. I want to give you purpose. I want to give you direction. I want to rescue you from yourself so that you might know what is truly meaningful and beautiful. Thank you that you are that beautiful, meaningful, purposeful thing that has come into our lives. That you speak your word to us, that you give us your word, which we'll hear in a little while, about who you are. That you haven't left us to the darkness, but have come as light into this world, that we might see you more beautifully and that you might shine more radiantly amidst the darkness. Thank you that you are the Messiah, Lord Jesus, and all that comes with that word, that you are the Christ, that you are the one for whom we have been searching, the whole world has been searching, and you have come. As we live in this Advent season and as we consider our lives and as we consider all that you have done and as we consider our families and as we consider what we do with our lives, Lord, may it all be through the lens of who you are, that you are Lord, that you are the Messiah, that you are the Word, that you are the light, that you are the Savior. These are not light things for us to dwell on, Lord. These are not just simple things for us to dwell on. These are not just things that are to be taken for granted, Lord. For each of us, may these become deeper truths in our hearts.
Lord, thank you that you reveal yourself to us. Thank you that you give us these gifts, and I pray, Lord, that as we examine these gifts together, that you, Holy Spirit, would move us, and that you would grow us, and that fruit would be produced. For all these truths, Lord, help us to trust in you. May we remember these truths in times of, uh, of goodness and in times of difficulty. Lord, when things are going well this season, when we are with family, when we are surrounded by loved ones, Lord, remind us of the goodness of who you are and that all these good things come from you. Or as we are in this season for many, this is a hard time, a lonely time. For many, it is a reminder of years gone by that were better than they are now. Or they're a reminder of the times when somebody was here with us and now they're not. They're a reminder of the longing for more than what is. In those times, Lord, may we look not to ourselves, not to gifts, not to presents, not to the world. May we look to you first and foremost. After all, you are Lord. You are our Lord. You are our Savior. You are our light that guides us in the darkness. Holy Spirit, give us strength to look to you and to rest not on our own understanding, but to allow you to anoint us and to bless us and to keep us and to make your face to shine upon us and to be gracious to us. May this be the truth in our lives that rings out and shines forth into a dark world. Lord, I thank you for offerings and for gifts. Thank you for the offering that we're about to collect. Thank you for the offerings that go forth, and we pray that you would anoint them with your blessing, that you would anoint them with your power, that you would anoint them with your fruitfulness, that they may go forward, and again, as we often pray, that they would go forward and, and, and just be a blessing for your kingdom and its work. Thank you, Lord, for all of these gifts. Thank you, Lord, that you are the giver. We pray all of this in Jesus' name. Amen. I'll invite the deacons to come forward and uh, collect first for our general fund. That will be the first plate that goes forward. And second for our reserve fund. And then if you're visiting with us, we have what is called the noisy offering. That's a, a, a time and a place for, uh, for anyone who has some spare change to come forward. And, and they can put some of that in. And that will go for chickens for underprivileged nations, people who need food, uh, who maybe have trouble getting it elsewhere. So uh, you'll know that when you see it and hear it.
I love it. We've got so many friends up here today. This is awesome. Thank you guys for coming to church today. Is there anybody else out there? Anybody else? Anybody else? Hey, what? you know what? I'm going to have like three minutes to talk, and then it can be your turn. Would that be pretty fair? Okay, thank you. Awesome. We're going to try that and see how that goes. All right, we are going to talk about, and this is great. You're helping me out. We are going to talk about a big word called authority. Another name for authority can maybe mean boss or the person in charge. Mama, mama, who's the boss? (laughs) Perfect. (laughs) I get to be the boss sometimes at my house. That's how that goes. And I bet you your mom is the boss at her house. Or when we go to grandma's, I bet you grandpa and grandma are the boss. (laughs) Yeah. It means listening to the person in charge and doing what they think is best for you. Sometimes the oldest person. Yep, you're right. Sometimes. What would that look like, you think, in the church? Who would be the boss or the person in charge of the church? You know what? (laughs) You know what? God puts people in charge in church, and God gave us Pastor Chris. God did give us Pastor Chris, and Pastor Chris is, he is, but you know what? Who is the boss of Pastor Chris, you think? Who? Who is the boss of Pastor Chris? Who does Pastor Chris get all? Exactly. God is the boss of Pastor Chris. You're right. And Pastor Chris and all of us, hey, shh, shh. Hey, remember, I got three minutes. I got two to go yet. And Pastor Chris listens to God, and he tells us what God wants us to do. Pastor Chris tells us about loving each other and loving our neighbors and being kind to each other. And trying to be like God. So when we're out and about and we're at home, the grown-ups in our lives and the people at school and the grown-ups in our lives, they help us remember that ultimately, that means in the end, God is the boss. He is the authority. He is in charge. And we have to do right by God. So we need to listen to what God wants us to do. And that's what those grown-ups in our lives are there to help us learn. So you guys are going to head downstairs, and you're going to learn a little bit more about that. You're going to learn a little bit more about God and what that means. So we're going to close our eyes. We're going to fold our hands up nice, and we're going to pray. We're going to pray. We're going to talk to God a minute, okay? Here we go. Dear God, thank you for today. Thank you that we could come to your house, that we could come to worship you, and that we could come to learn more and more about you. And help us to remember and to follow in your footsteps and to do what you would have us do. In your name we pray. Amen. Friends, if you're visiting with us, we have a little practice. Oh, here, let's put that in the noisy offering. Oh, I will. All right, let's stand up. And we like to say something before we go. We have something we say. We say, the Lord be with you, okay? So we're going to say that on three. The Lord be with you. Okay, one, two, three. The Lord be with you. All right, friends. Just for clarification, the elders are technically my boss. We, we, we function in a very democratic way around here, actually. The, uh... <laughs> well, uh, we're going again to be examining this. Last week, if you're, uh, we're looking at these titles of Christ. Last week, we looked at the title Word. Uh, and if you're joining us again, we have, uh, actually, these are words that are in, obviously, in our Bible, but they are in the Old Testament on one side here, if you want to come up and look. We have it in Hebrew, uh, the word is devar, the second in Greek is uh, logos, and then that's word. This week, we have, uh, we have the word Messiah, and we're going to pack, unpack that a little bit. Uh, also, uh, the equivalent, the Messiah is the Old Testament in Hebrew. Uh, the New Testament word for Messiah, and we'll get into this, is actually Christ. Christ is not Jesus' last name, actually. That is his title. And we'll get into what that, what that means. So, if you would, join me in prayer for a few moments as we pray for a blessing on the reading of the word. And, and then we'll examine this together. Let's pray. Lord, I thank you so much for your word, that you speak to us, that you remind us of who you are, and that you tell us truths about yourself, about your authority on our lives. Lord, I pray you help us to hear well this morning as we examine this together. 
I pray that the meditations of my heart and the words of my uh, mouth would be pleasing in your sight, Lord, and may they be a blessing for us. May you speak through me. May they not be my words, but yours. I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. So, last week, I asked us to be ready to jump around, and I got bad news. We're going to be jumping around this whole sermon series. So, uh, I'll, I hope you have a few fingers or some, some places where you, can, uh, where you can mark your Bibles, or just follow along on the screen. But first, we're going to read from 1 Samuel 16, verse 13. And it says this, So, Samuel took the horn of oil and anointed him in the presence of his brothers. This is about King David. And from that day on, the Spirit of the Lord came powerfully upon David. So that's our first verse. And then Samuel went to Ramah. And then we're going to jump all the way over, actually, to that verse I read this morning at the beginning of our service, our time together. Luke 2, verse 11. This is the last part of it. After the uh, shepherds have been out and the angels come and speak to them and they tell them this again, today in the town of David, a Savior has been born. He is the Messiah, the Lord. And then finally, over to 1 John 2, verse 27. And I promise, this will all tie together. This will all... It'll, uh, it'll come together. We'll see how it's all connected. 1 Samuel 2, verse 27. As for you, the anointing you received from him remains in you. And you do not need anyone to teach you, but as his anointed teaches you about all things, and as that anointing is real, not counterfeit, not fake, just as it has taught you, remain in him. This is God's word. My dad, when he was young, he was a little mischievous. And my grandmother eventually got a little tired of him doing this and being a little disobedient. And um, one time she had to go to Meyer. Actually, Derek, it's the mire you work at, as that mire back in the day, to be specific. And, and my dad, he, um, my, my, my grandmother was taking him to this mire over on Kalamazoo and 28th Street, and she was just tired of him misbehaving. And so sometimes, as we do as parents, we, we offer a little bit of a, a, I don't know if I want to call it a threat, a warning. Now, my grandmother, she was like the sweetest, kindest uh, lady, I can't even imagine her doing this, but I guess she did. She told my dad, if you walk away from me in the store, I'm leaving you there. And uh, they got to Meyer and they started doing some shopping. And what do you think he did? He walked away. And, and he got separated from her and actually he couldn't find her. And he remembered those words, and he thought, she went home without me. So what does he do? But he goes to look for somebody to help him out, and who do you go in a time of trouble when, you are, when you're lost and, and alone and scared, but you go and find the one who has authority, and, and he found the, the, the store security guard, and he said, my mom left me here. Can you help me? And so they eventually tracked down my grandmother again, like the sweetest lady that you can imagine. And, and, and she got a talking to from the security officer. But uh, we know when we're in trouble, we're, sometimes we're supposed to look for somebody who, who is an authority. We're looking for somebody who, who has the authority, somebody who has the, uh, the, the, the power to do something about our problem. And... and and we do that. How did, they, how did my dad know that that guy had, an, had the authority? Well, what did he maybe look for? Maybe a badge? Yeah, we look for a uniform. We talk about people who have a uniform that, that, that's maybe a symbol of authority, of, of power. That's what my dad did. Well, you know what? I think that, that in a way has always been the case. 
At least after the fall, after humanity messes things up and after things get broken, uh, humanity is looking for something, someone with authority. Now, in the Old Testament, God actually, off from the get-go, he said, well, I want to be the authority in your lives. And the people said, uh, uh, surprisingly, you know, God, he's the highest authority. And the people said, well, no, we want a king to be the one who's uh, the authority over us. And God says, you don't want a king. And, God, and they say, well, yeah, we do. We want a king. And so God gives them a king. Uh, and that's a whole other story about how that plays out. But God grants that to them and says, you know what? I'll give you authority. I'll give you one with authority. Because that's what people want. They want somebody with authority. Now, back in the day, in the Old Testament, when, when people became a king, there was something that was called anointing. Anointing. This was something special. It was a, a, a something that uh, we, it's a, one of those words we hear, anointing, and, and we might have a vague understanding of what that is, but anointing is what it is. Well, I'd like to show you what anointing is, and I've already got a plant in the audience here. Uh, Nyla, would you mind coming up real quick? She agreed to this, so. All right, Nyla. I'm going to have, and building committee, I'm going to be careful. Not to make a mess, I'm just going to have you put your hands right here in the bowl. Anointing is taking oil, olive oil probably. I've got the extra virgin olive oil. That's what they would have used probably. And anointing is putting oil all over. And now... Yeah, rub it around there. Now, I'm going to just do this for the sake of our building and carpet. Anointing in the Old Testament was... Oh, hold up your hands really quick, Nyla, as much as you can without... Do you see that? What does it look like? Shiny. You can see that. It's meant to be. And now you'll smell like olive oil. That's pretty... All right, you take the cloth with you. Except for, it wasn't just that. It was, uh, you can see the olive oil. Olive oil, if you know, it's sticky. It's, it, 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 it gets and it stays. Anointing in the Old Testament, though, wasn't just olive oil on the hands. It was over the whole body. You can imagine what that might look like. You can imagine what anointing would look like, that, that this would mark somebody. It would be recognizable. That's what's happening with King David here in our text of 1 Samuel. He's being marked as the one with authority. Don't worry, Ron. We'll wash it off later. It's marking David as the one who has authority because God has called David to be the king. That's what's going to happen here. He's going to come and, and he's going to anoint him with oil. And he's going, to, he's going to pour oil over him. He takes this with oil and pours it all over. There's verses in the Old Testament that talk about anointing and the, the oil drips down and, and our, our face shines with that oil. It's purposeful. And actually, this isn't just a small thing. This happens three times to David. First here in, in 1 Samuel, and then in, in 2 Samuel 2 and 2 Samuel 5, it, uh, David's anointed three times. We remember all these other stories about David, about Goliath, and, and maybe his uh, exploits and going and getting into trouble with Bathsheba, but we can't skip over this part, his anointing, because it sets him up for what he's going to be and who God is calling him to be. It's a mark the, the, the oil is going on him, and it's marking him for who he is. He is the anointed one of God to be king, to be the authority. Now, we have to understand a few words, and, and we have to, I want you to fill these in, these words to understand. There's two words. One is Messiah and one is Christ. Do you know what they both mean? They both mean the anointed one. That's what they mean. We say these words anointing and, or we say Messiah and we, and we say Christ, but that's what they mean. 
In the Old Testament, first Messiah, when, in the Old Testament, when we read about Samuel here coming and anointing David to be king, it says, Vai me she. That comes from the word, the root of the Hebrew, Meshiah, which sounds an awful lot like our word, Messiah. That's where we get it. He is coming, David, or Samuel took the horn of oil and anointed him. That's the word. So David becomes the anointed one of God with the authority to carry out God's will. And Christ, we know this word, we say it. We say it in our songs, we, we, we say it. There's this word Christ that we use. He is the anointed one who is to come. I want to look at Matthew 1, verse 16 for a second, because again, this is everywhere in the New Testament, this title of Jesus. I love this. This is a long genealogy. It's a, a, a telling of all the people who have come before Jesus and his whole family list and, and everything and, and all the people who have come before him in his ancestry, all the people who God has worked through. And, and at the end of this list in this New Testament, in this first book of the New Testament, it wants us to see that after all of these people, somebody is coming It says, Jacob, the father of Joseph, the husband of Mary, and Mary was the mother of Jesus, who was called the Messiah, the Christ, the anointed one. I think we're all waiting for somebody with authority. My dad, when he was in the store, he was in trouble and he was lost and he thought he had been left, uh, though he actually hadn't, but he thought he had. And, and what does he do? But he goes and he seeks out the one with authority. The problem is sometimes our sense of where to look is, is misguided. Our compass is misguided. We want to look everywhere else for authority except for God. People are looking everywhere. They want authority. I know they do. People come across many anointed, many, many people who they think have anointings. But unless it's the anointed one, we're in trouble. Unless it is the one who has been given the authority, well, I wonder how meaningful it really is. The truth is, we do. We need someone to follow. And we also need to know that that person has authority. Because we need somebody to guide us and lead us in our broken world, and somebody to guide us and lead us when we're not sure where to go, and somebody to guide us and lead us and, and tell us that it's okay, they've got it. And so the angels come and Luke 2, verse 11, that we just read earlier, and, and, and they come to these shepherds, somebody who know, people who know all about what it is to have authority over, over sheep, about what it is to lead and to guide and to, and, and to uh, have authority. They know, they know the importance of needing somebody to follow because they are caring for these sheep all the time, protecting them and keeping them and, and guiding them and, and, and rescuing them. The shepherds, they know all about the importance of authority, about somebody to follow. And the shepherds are sitting there in their fields at night and, and here the angels come and they tell them, guess what, the anointed one is here. The Messiah, the Christ, the authority that you've been waiting for. That's not a small thing. They, they know what they've been waiting for. They know the stories of King David and the anointing he received. They know the story of how the anointed one in their tradition and in their history, that is the one who God has blessed to have authority. 
They're the ones that they are supposed to follow, and they don't waste any time. He's in the anointed one. The Lord has come. Let earth receive their king. Jesus, though, is not just anointed by, uh, he's, he's anointed for sure. It tells us in Matthew 3, verse 17, Jesus comes. He's anointed not just the chosen one of God, but he's baptized. And then the Holy Spirit comes down and it says it rests on him like a dove. He's anointed by the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit empowers him, gives him authority, leads him, guides him, directs him into where he should go. And Jesus is here. Is Jesus the anointed one, the authority in our lives? It's a question we have to ask. Is he the anointed one? Do we really believe he is? Is he really the one that we trust in with authority and power? Is he really the one who has the authority to cast out demons? Is he really the one who has the authority to to tell us what to do and what not to do? Is he really the one who has authority to even forgive our own sins? all the wrongdoing, because if we say no, well, then we're going to keep searching and we're going to keep being lost. But if we say yes, well, that's good news, I think. Because the anointed one, the Christ, the Messiah, is come and we know him. He invites us to know him. He invites us to follow him. He's the anointed one of God. What more could we ask for? When Jesus says, follow me, it's not just a light invitation. It's not just a walk in the park. It's not an invitation just to say, you know, it's all going to be good from now on. No, it's, a, it's an invitation from the Christ, from the Messiah, from the one who has authority to say, follow me and in my footsteps. If we say yes to that calling, that is not a small thing. It means saying yes to Jesus, and it means saying no to a lot of other stuff. Because Jesus is the way. He's the truth and the life. That's not a very popular thing in our culture to say that there's one way. It's not a very popular thing to say there's one way to follow. It's not very popular to say that that somebody, one person has the right answer, but Jesus is him. Jesus is the anointed one. He has the authority. When we follow him, that's what we acknowledge. But not only is he the anointed one, not only just is he the Messiah, not just is he the Christ, the Messiah, the Christos. Actually, he anoints us as well. 1 John 2.27 that we read earlier. Not just we have the answer for the one who, uh, who is the anointed one, but, well, we're also anointed with authority. As for you, the anointing you received from him remains in you, and you do not need anyone to teach you, but as his anointing teaches you, about all things, and as that anointing is real, not counterfeit, not fake, not made up, just as it has taught you, remain in him. God anoints you, brothers and sisters. He anoints us. He gives us his spirit. And Nyla, this is where I'll have you stick your hands up. Are they still sticky and shiny? They are. Everyone look at Nyla's hands. Thank you. It's soothing. There's a whole other point of the sermon right there, I guess. But God's anointing doesn't just go away. Thank you, Nyla, for sitting without washing your hands, as I asked. God's anointing doesn't go away. It sticks. And it stays. And it's evident. And it's shiny. And it's bright. And the light that Christ shines on us, it shines off of us and through us and goes out.
God delegates his authority to us. That's an amazing thing. We have been anointed with God's spirit and we are told we have authority. God could do everything by himself, but you know, instead he says, hey, I want to bring you into my family. I don't just want to do it all. I want to invite, invite you into my kingdom. I want you to reign in the kingdoms, and so, like King David, I'm anointing you. And it's not a light thing. It's not something that's necessarily easy. Sometimes it's maybe sticky and messy, but it does shine, and it does change, and it does stay around. Jesus says, all authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me, and now you are anointed under my authority. I've delegated this power to you in Luke 10, 19. Go, therefore, I give you power to do these things. This is significant, brothers and sisters. We cannot let this go to the wayside. I want us to cling on to this understanding that Jesus is the Christ, the Messiah. He is the Lord. He is the one who has authority, who gives us authority. We're claiming that Jesus is the authority over our lives. It's good to know that it means that we have the answer, that Jesus is the anointed one and that he has anointed each and every one of you who have received the Holy Spirit, accepted Christ as your Savior, as your Messiah. That moves us, it empowers us to act. It's no small thing to be anointed, it is a gift. To think about this week, think about these questions. These are in your bulletin as well. What do Messiah and Christ mean? I hope you know the answer by this point, the anointed one. And why is it good news that Jesus is the Messiah, the Christ? And as followers of Jesus, God anoints you with the Holy Spirit. Consider what that means. Delve into that a little bit this week. Reflect on that. What does that mean that you have been anointed? That you are Christians? Anointed one ends. The Christ. Take comfort, brothers and sisters, knowing that you know the one with the authority. You know the one who has the answer. You know the one who, who has the authority to do, well, what God does. He has the authority to forgive all of our wrongdoings. He has the authority to tell us what to do. He has the authority to guide us. He has the authority to comfort us. Nothing else has authority over our lives. Let's pray. Lord God, we thank you that... You have sent the Messiah, the Christ, the one who has the authority and that even as the world still looks, as people are seeking and guiding, seeking to find the authority in their lives, that we have the answer. We know who has the authority and that's you. You have the authority to forgive sins. You have the authority to tell us when we need correcting. You have authority to even change our lives. Lord, when we read that you are the Messiah, the Christ, let us not just move on and let us not just take that for granted. Let us remember and reflect on what that means. May we remember that you are the anointed one of God, that you're the one we've been looking for. I pray all of this in Jesus' name. Amen. I'd like to invite you to rise to sing, Holy Spirit, living breath of God.
As we've just talked about, you are the anointed ones of God, and when we saw Nihilus' hands covered in oil, what happened when the light shone on it? It shone brightly, it shined, right? Consider this blessing then as we go. May the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord make his face to shine upon you and to be gracious to you and to give you his blessing now and forever. Amen. Thank you.